And as we know, uh, we're walking through this series of Mark. Uh, we're going to be walking through the, the book of Mark throughout the next um, foreseeable future. And we're going to take it a little slow and take it piece by piece because there's some really cool things that we want to see about Jesus and that the Lord wants to show us in this. And so um, when Josh, a- Josh asked me, uh, hey, will you uh, preach this uh, on June 9th? Is that what day it is? Yeah. Um, and I'm like, okay, cool. What are we preaching on? He's like, we're going to preach on the book of Mark. And I was like, yes, Lord, you are amazing because I took a whole semester on the book of Mark in college. And so the Lord has prepared me for such a time as this. And so uh, I'm really excited to be sharing this book because Mark has some really great things to say. And like Josh has been uh, talking about, it is about the actions of Jesus, not just not what he preached or what he said, but what he was doing, um, how he got up close to people and healed them, uh, and how he approached the Pharisees and the people who were teaching the law. I'm so excited uh, to dive into this book with you. If you don't know me, I'm Michaela. I, uh, I've been going to Welcome for the last couple of years and serving in any way that I can. Um, most recently, doing discipleship groups. Um, who here is in a connection group? Yeah, woo! Yeah, I love my connection group leaders. Um, what I do, uh, what I've done is just write a bunch of questions about the sermon that Josh preaches. That's not what this morning is going to be. I get to actually like share the message and not just ask you questions like, um, what does it look like for you to grow deeper in your relationship with Christ? Uh, we can arrange that later on if you want, but uh, we're really going to dive into the word this morning. Um, so let me pray for us as we go in. Jesus, would you show us more of yourself this morning? Amen. All right, so that was quick and awesome. So I'm gonna, here's how this morning is going to work. Um, we're going to look at where Jesus has been, um, and I'm actually going to show you. I brought a map with me on the screen. We'll put that up in a second. Um, we're going to see where Jesus has been, and, we're, now we're gonna, and then we're going to take a look at what Jesus is doing right now in Scripture Um, and how that applies uh, to us today. And so uh, let's just recap on where we've been. We're in Mark chapter 2, so we've been through uh, Mark chapter 1, and so we start Mark chapter 1 where Jesus goes to get baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Um, And so if I can grab that map that should come up. Okay, there it is. Um, So here is a map of Israel. And so Jesus was from Nazareth. Do we all see Nazareth at the very top? Um, and so he traveled all the way down to Jerusalem, that first arrow that has a number one by it, um, to be baptized in the Jordan River um, by his cousin, John the Baptist. And then we read in chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 12, that Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan, and that kind of happens around the Jerusalem area right there. You can see number two in the Judean, Je- Judean desert. Um, so he's tempted, uh, by Satan and then he begins his ministry. So he travels all the way back up to the area of Galilee. We see that in the number three arrow. Um, and, and for the next couple of chapters, he's going to be spending his time in Galilee, um, going around to different synagogues and different towns, preaching the gospel. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And is specifically in the town of Capernaum. Uh, that's where Jesus is going to be stationed for a lot of his ministry. A lot of the people that he called um, are going to be stationed in that place. And so uh, when we talk about like Jesus being at home, it'll be kind of in that area. And so this is what we're looking at as we go. And you'll we'll hear about Jesus going by the Sea of Galilee, which is right up there on top. It's that little body of water. Um, so just so you guys can get a visual, how many of you went on the Israel trip this past year? Does this look a little familiar? Can you like picture it in your mind? I want to go someday, so I can only picture it in my imagination, but you guys know what it really looks like, so I'm very jealous of you. So that's where Jesus has been. Um, he's been from Nazareth to Jerusalem, out to the Jordan River to get baptized. He, he's traveling. He's seeing the sights, and he is getting the word out, and he's proclaiming, um, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and he's displaying this in actions. In 1 Corinthians verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 20, it says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So this is what Jesus is demonstrating um, to the people, that, that God in Jesus has come with authority, 
and the kingdom of God um, is not just what you talk about or what you uphold, but it's demonstrated in the power that Jesus shows us. And so um, here's where we find Jesus specifically today. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, we ended chapter one with the verse, the last verse, and it said this. Um, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. So where we see Jesus right now is basically he is the first century version of going viral. So uh, if we don't know what that means, uh, here's, here's a millennial like fact, whatever. Going viral means that a video has been liked and shared a couple times. People are like, um, look at this video, it's so funny, ha, 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 laughed out loud, it's great. And so everybody's starting to hear what Jesus is doing and starting to hear rumors of him healing and of him preaching the gospel, and they're curious. Um, and so Jesus is blowing up uh, in the towns during this time. And so the spirits feared and obeyed him when he cast them out. Jesus was known in the spirit world, um, but our world was just discovering him. This is what we talked about a little bit last week. And we see that Jesus would preach in the synagogues and go throughout the towns, and he was preaching and healing. Uh, he was preaching the gospel and then demonstrating the gospel to people. Again, remember, we're talking about um, Mark as a gospel of action, a gospel of action. And But then Jesus um, got so big and people wanted to be around him so much, he would have to go out to desolate places and spend time with the Father and get focused on the mission over and over again. Um, and so he would have time with the Lord to regroup, fill up, and focus on what the main point is. And so um, everybody wanted to be with him. Everybody wanted to touch him or watch him heal people um, or preach. And Jesus was restoring all things to himself, um, all things to God in these places. And so that's where we find Jesus today. And so we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 1. I'm just going to give you a recap of, of these passages. And so in chapter 2, verse 1, we find Jesus back at Capernaum. Uh, and, and the scriptures say that he's at home. Uh, this would, this, some scholars say that this was the home of uh, Peter, uh, but we don't know that for sure. Um, it, but this was definitely Jesus' home base where he would stay when he came. And there was a multitude of people gathered in his house. And so there were so many people, scripture says, that you weren't even able to get into the front door. They were shoulder to shoulder, like super up against each other. Um, and there were rumors that Jesus was there. There was rumors that Jesus was in the home teaching and healing and proclaiming the good news. Uh, but you couldn't really tell because it was so packed out. But we did know that there was a packed house. And so um, here's a real life example of this. I just got to spend uh, the last week in Nashville, Tennessee. Has anybody in here been to Nashville? Yeah, isn't it fun? I love Nashville. My brother lives there, and so I got to go visit him. And there's a main like road um, on in Nashville called Broadway. It's just like where all of the music stuff is. It's really awesome. Does anybody know what is very specific about this week in Nashville? Does anybody know what happened this week? Okay, this week, <clears throat> this weekend in Nashville was the CMT Festival. Have you guys heard of that? So you have like an award show, and then literally they, they set up stages outside on like every corner of this city. And so you can walk around and listen to different artists, um, like famous country artists, play their music. And it's really exciting. And so Nashville gets packed out because all of everybody's favorite uh, singers and songwriters are there um, for these awards, but they also play shows. And so that was really exciting. I just wanted to go visit my brother, but that happened and it was great. And so uh, one night I was, I was walking around by myself because I am just alone sometimes and uh, <laughs> trying to figure out what I was going to do. My brother was working, my aunt and uncle were there, but they were at a show. And so I'm like, I got nothing to do. I'm just going to walk around. And so I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor that Brooks and Dunn, do you guys know Brooks and Dunn? Memory. That's my mom's favorite song of theirs. Um, so I heard a rumor that Brooks and Dunn were going to be playing in this big stage right in the middle of the main road in Tennessee. So I was like, oh, yes, I'm going to get there early. I'm just going to stand there and so I can get like a video for my mom because it's like one of her favorite country bands. And so <clears throat> I'm standing there uh, waiting for an hour for this 
this thing to happen. And so Brooks and Dunn come on, and they're playing their show, and it's really exciting. And I notice that there's people everywhere around me. I've been, like, focusing on the stage and, like, watching people come in and out. But they're, like, getting closer to me and, like, packing in, like, sardines. And it's getting a little hot uh, because I'm, I'm by myself. I'm, like, shoulder to shoulder with strangers. And we're, both, we're all really excited about Brooks and Dunn. And I get a text from my brother, and he's like, hey, you want to meet for ice cream just down the block? And I'm like, yeah, sure, let me just weave my way through this crowd. Bad mistake. I should have just stayed where I was. Um, so as I'm weaving my way through the crowd, I'm getting nice and personal with everybody there because they're literally shoulder to shoulder. I don't think that for the at least five minutes I breathed my own air like my own fresh air. I was breathing other people's exhales. I was so close to them. And so um, I, I find my way to this like little gap where like people are trying to make their way through and um, they are not getting through. And then you run into like this really angry person that thinks you're trying to get to the front of the stage and they're like, I'm not letting you through. I'm like, I'm just trying to go get ice cream with my brother, please. Um, I had to keep my hands in my pockets because I didn't want to touch somebody's butt. Um, it was just a really, really awkward situation. Um, and I imagine that this would be kind of like what it was like in the home where Jesus was teaching. Uh, you can't even breathe your own air, but it's worth it because Jesus is there. Now, I'm not comparing Brooks and Dunn to Jesus, but, um, but I can compare the situations. All right, you, are you guys tracking with me? Can we, say, can we say that? Is that good? Okay, Brooks and Dunn is awesome, by the way. They're probably like, I don't listen to country very much, but they're top notch. I love them. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> the, this house is being packed out. We, see, we read in scripture, um, these men come up carrying their friend who is paralyzed on a mat. And, and I like to visualize that this is like a backboard that's really flat. Um, but when scripture ta- <laughs> when we look into the scripture, it was more like a yoga mat that you could roll up and take different places. So there's four friends carrying their paralyzed friend on a yoga mat, coming up to this packed out house and saying, how in the world are we going to get into this house? How in the world are we going to get in here? And then they have that one friend. They have that one friend. I'm, I'm, I don't think this is actually, like, someone had to have this idea. Um, raise your hand if you have a crazy friend that comes up with the most stupid ideas ever that you go along with. Okay, if you're not raising your hand, I'm sorry, but you're that friend. <laughs> like, I just have to tell you the truth that now this is a place of truth. And so if you were not raising your hand, you're that friend. It's okay, I am that friend. Uh, so we can, we can do that together. Um, we'll have a party later on. It'll be great. And uh, so there's that one crazy friend that says, I have an idea. Oh, no. Let's, let's climb up the side of this building. Just listen, he's, he, just hear me out. Let's climb up the side of this building onto the roof. And then we are going to bust this roof open and cause property damage to somebody's home that we don't know. So just so that we can lower our friend who's paralyzed on a yoga mat through a hole in the ceiling, maybe so that we can see Jesus and he might heal them. What? <laughs> that, what kind of idea is that? Um, but they did it. Um, they were desperate enough to go as far as they were willing to see Jesus, even if they had only heard that he was there. Wow, how desperate are we to run to Jesus in that way? Are we? I have to ask myself that question. And then I imagine um, the homeowner. <laughs> uh, this, these people are breaking his roof open, and he's like, how am I going to pay to fix my roof? That's going to be like a week worth of work. What is going on? They're causing damage to my property. And Jesus looks at them as they lower the man down on a yoga mat. And he says, your faith has healed you. What? <laughs> Jesus, the first thing you say when these people have ripped open my roof is, you, your faith has healed you? Yes. Because they were desperate to get to Jesus. Are we desperate to get to Jesus this morning? Um, And so Jesus saw their faith, um, and and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And and in Mark, this is the first time that Jesus had looked at someone and said, your sins are forgiven. So it was kind of a shocker to everybody that was in the room. 
They're like, what? He, for, he forgives sins and he says that he heals. Um, and so Jesus asks them a question. He's like, uh, what is better? To do good or to do bad? To forgive sins or to heal? <laughs> Which one's better? Which one's easier? The, the answer, spoiler, is no human could do either of those things other than the help of God, with the help of God. And so uh, it, Jesus catches them in, in their thoughts uh, that he perceives from afar, and he says, what are you thinking? <laughs> what are you thinking, guys? Like, I can do both because I am he. I am. Um, I am God. And so he, heal, he both forgives the man of his sins and heals him. Um, and, and now let's, let's look at the man. For the first time, not only are his sins, are, that are, are they forgiven, but he gets up from that place. He rolls up the mat that he had been laying on almost for a long time, not being able to move, and he goes home. Jesus says, arise and go home and take your mat and get out of here. And so this man, for the first time, can walk home and tell of what Jesus has done for him. What an amazing story. And then uh, from this place, uh, Jesus has to get out of that room because I had to get out of that uh, place in Nashville too. Um, he gets out and he goes by the Sea of Galilee teaching different people, whoever would listen. And he passed by a tax booth and he saw a tax collector. Um, and, and we all know that tax collectors were, were Jews that were very despised by other Jews because they worked for the Roman government. And a lot of them didn't make a ton of money, so they would ask for more taxes than were actually needed and would pocket the money. So they're known as scum, traitors, uh, people who only cared about themselves. And so uh, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee and walking around, it, and this man catches his eye, a tax collector at a booth. And it's Levi. Um, his other name would also be Matthew, the one who wrote the book of Matthew. Uh, so just keep that in your mind. Of, of what Matt, uh, what Levi becomes because of Jesus. What a transformation already that we can see. And so the, Jesus walks up to this tax, tax collector and he said, follow me. And immediately Levi got up and followed him, scripture says. Now, the, we see that Jesus had called some fi fishermen uh, in chapter 1. He had four fishermen on his team already, and now he's going up to a tax collector, which was despised by everyone, and he's like, come be on my team too. And, and what we see is um, later on in Scripture, those uh, fishermen can kind of go back to their trade, like they'll always kind of have that. Uh, but for Levi, it was a one and done. If he left that, that booth, he couldn't go back to being a tax, tax collector. He turned in his keys. And there was no going back. And so the faith of Levi in that moment was, I'm going to trade something that I know is wrong or an or a image that I know is wrong, and I'm going to trade it for something better. And so he goes uh, with the Lord, and so now it's a team of five in Jesus, which is really exciting. Not really the group of, uh, of people that you would expect uh, but Jesus goes to Levi's house anyway, and he sits uh, with him and other sinners and other tax collectors, and the church people are freaking out. Like, why would you go uh, sit with sinners and tax collectors and hang out with them and preach the gospel? They're, they're sinners. You should be over here with the righteous. Um, the Pharisees didn't know what they wanted because they didn't want him in the temple anyway either, so they were just confused this whole time uh, on what they actually wanted. And so... Uh, yeah, he, he stayed with them, uh, and Jesus says this um, when talking about sinners, that, the sinners that he eats with. He says, I haven't come to save the righteous, but the sinners. I've come for them. Why? Uh, why didn't he come for the Pharisees instead of the sinners and the tax collectors? Well, the Pharisees had their neat little box that they could fit in, and they had their faith figured out, or so they thought. They were perfected. They did everything that they wanted to do. Uh, and, but if Jesus brought something new to them, they were very close to it because they knew uh, what was right, or they thought they knew it was right. What Jesus is looking for, for his followers, are people that are willing to be broken, that know that they're sinful, that know that they need a Savior so that God can dwell within them. 
And so the mission that Jesus had this entire time was to go to the sinners because they know he knew that he would be able to fill them up completely and use them in new ways that he couldn't with the Pharisees. And so that makes me check my heart a little bit. Am I willing to be broken in front of the Lord to be used by him instead of just trying to fit in this neat little religious box? And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, but that's the dynamic that's going on. Jesus is seeing the people that are right in front of him. And so um, as he calls this team together, his, uh, his disciples, he's got a cool little crew. And uh, they're not really the Avengers that uh, we think they would be, with, are we? Um, uh, yes, I am going to quote Nick Fury from Avengers. <clears throat> uh, so if you haven't seen the Avengers movies, um, it's about the Avengers and how all these superheroes come together with great powers and great responsibility. And so um, Nick Fury, the, the man who brings all this together, he has an idea. And this is his idea. He says, um, to bring together a group of remarkable people see if they, to see if they can become something more, if they could work together when we needed them to fight the battles we never could. And so um, I kind of think of this as uh, a look into how we think these awesome teams should come together, grabbing the best people um, that are the best at their skill uh, and bringing them into a team to accomplish something great. And Jesus picks the lowest of the low in that society to do the same thing. And guess what? The disciples are the reason that we sit here today because they were willing to be filled by the Holy Spirit they were willing to follow Christ no matter what. Um, yes, they faltered and they fell from time to time, but they, they continued to come back to Jesus and say, I'm in. Even though I falter, I'm in. And so um, I have to check my heart again. Is that me? Um, am I doing that as well? So then we see that uh, Jesus is asked, asked by other disciples why his disciples aren't fasting. Um, this is the next little passage that we see. Um, he's asked, why are your people not fasting like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and even John the Baptist and his disciples would fast? Um, and Jesus explains uh, three things. First, he talks about what the bridegroom at a wedding feast. I was at a wedding last night, and it was super fun, and I'm super excited for my friends to um, be starting their life together and uh, moving into what God has for them. And so uh, Jesus asks for, uh, says uh, that he is God himself and that he is with the, his disciples. And this is what he's alluding to. And so if, if I'm at a wedding with the people that I'm celebrating with, I'm not going to not eat. Like last night I chowed down and it was awesome. And I was talking to Ethan about this this morning. I drank four cups of coffee at 6 p.m. And then I couldn't go to sleep. Like it was a party. I was like hopped up on caffeine and it was great. And um, then I suffered for it later and it was fine. But we're here and all is well. And <laughs> But you're going to party and celebrate when you're with the people that you're supposed to be celebrating. Jesus Christ is in the room. And so why would his disciples need to fast? Because it's time to be feasting because the kingdom of God has come near. And the kingdom of God is right in front of them. So why do they need to fast anymore? But in, in other scriptures, he said, he, Jesus says, um, there will be a time that they need to fast because I won't be here. Uh, and, and they'll need to remember and, and be with me in that way. But right now, right now I'm here. Right now the kingdom is here, so we're going to throw a party. And then um, he talks about a new patch to an old garment. The new patch shrinks and rips away the old worn garment. Um, don't put something new on something old, he says. Um, you're just going to hurt yourself. And then he talks about the new wine and the old wineskins. There's a new kingdom that is coming. Um, Jesus uh, has an opportunity uh, to share about how the box that the Pharisees are putting their religion in is not going to work um, for the kingdom that God is bringing. And so there's no room to expand in the old way of thinking. Um, I think Josh has explained this a little bit before, but uh, the custom was when new wine was made, it would be put into a new uh, like leather wineskin because they had room to kind of open up a little bit. It was still kind of breathable. And for the wine to ferment a little bit, it needed some breathing room. It needs some room to expand. But if you put brand new wine into a wine skin that had already expanded, it's going to break it. 
because there's no more ability for it to stretch. And so that's what Jesus was saying to um, the people that were asking. There's no room for you to stretch. We need some, we need some new wineskins so that the kingdom of God can fit um, in a new way into what we're doing. And so that's what he was trying to explain. Not that it was all bad before, but there just needs to be a new vessel for what is happening. And, and what we find is that vessel is you and me. Um, the kingdom of God is no longer needing to be in a box or in the holiest of holies, but God intends to put the kingdom of God inside the hearts of people. And so he's preparing it, but the Pharisees and the people don't understand that quite yet. And so then Jesus and his disciples are walking through a, a grain field, and they pick some grain. This is the Sabbath. So they pick some grain, and they eat it. And people are like, why are you picking grain and eating it? It's the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, you can't do work. And so picking grain would be considered work, right? So uh, in their mind, it made sense. Um, and Jesus reminds them of this story um, of David. And this comes from 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 7. And, and we read it in Scripture that David and his, uh, his people were in dire need of food, and there was no food for them to have except in the priest's quarters. Um, and so uh, David walks up to the priest. He's like, we need food. Do you have any? And the priest is like, the only food that we have is the food that only the priest can eat because it's been blessed. Um, and David's like, we need food. Uh, or we were we are gonna die, <clears throat> and the priest says, "Are your men clean?" Asking if they're pure, and David said, "Yes, yes, they are." And the priest allows them to eat the bread um, because uh, because the sacraments and the things that we give to God are also intended to be for us too. Um, not that we are God, uh, because that is heresy, and I, I will never say that. But um, God intends good things through the rules that he has for us and the laws that he has. Um, they're intended to grow us, to give us what we need, to help us feel loved by God, um, and for him to become real in our lives. That's why, uh, that's what the rules and the laws were intended for, but they've lost the meaning of it. And so th uh, that's what Jesus was trying to explain. Um, yeah, the laws of God were good, but they were also considerate of the need of humanity. So if you don't feel free to do what you need to do to be with God on the Sabbath, then it is controlling you, and it is not meant for that. Um, because we see Christ say that Sabbath was meant for man and not man for the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath was meant for us to rest. Uh, and that's what he tells the people in this story. And finally, Jesus enters back into the synagogue. He's done going around uh, and, and hanging out with people in Galilee. And he's stopped by a man with a withered hand. And the Pharisees are watching him closely, like back in the corner. I can see them in like a lounge chair, like, what's this guy going to do now? Um, just waiting to pick out the things that Jesus is not allowed to do on the Sabbath. Um, instead of seeing that there's a man in need that needs help, um, that's been waiting for Jesus to get there. And so they're, they're ready to, to watch Jesus um, do this thing because they want to trap him. Uh, and, and the custom in the synagogues on the Sabbath was that you could only uh, pray healing over someone if it was life or death on that day. Otherwise, you weren't allowed to pray for healing on that day. And um, Jesus looks at them. He says, is it better for me to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath, to, to give life or take life? Um, and they didn't have an answer uh, because you obviously the answer is to give life. We always want to give life on any day of the week. And so Jesus, Jesus says, man, come here. And the man comes to him, and he heals his hand. Why? Um, because God loves the people that are right in front of him. Um, and maybe it was life or death that that man uh, needed a hand that was able to work. Or maybe he had a job that was his livelihood that he needed to be able to use his hands in. We don't know. We don't know the man's story, um, but Jesus did. Um, Jesus understood, and he put aside the old ways of thinking and the box that uh, the Pharisees were using as the Sabbath uh, to heal the man that was right in front of him. And so uh, there is a synopsis that was really long. Thanks for um, sticking with it. But Jesus does some amazing things uh, in this 
this scripture, uh, and he really, really shows the kingdom come and the Father's will being done, which was uh, that the kingdom is at hand. Um, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is good, and the kingdom is for the hearts of the people that are willing to be broken and follow Jesus. And so um, we're going to look at four points this morning um, of what we want to pull out of this scripture um, that Jesus is really trying to drive home. The first point is Jesus valued people over religion. He valued people over religion. We see this in the first story that despite the scorn that the people in the house were giving Jesus, he not only forgave a man's sins, but he also healed him from his ailment. And so um, d- despite w- what people thought you could and couldn't do, uh, we-, we live uh, in-, in a world that kind of either loves religion or despises religion. There's some um, legalism in different places. And uh, it's kind of confusing to me sometimes of uh, when should I act properly or not properly or pray this over someone or speak life in this way. And and that was happening in this time as well. Uh, Sometimes I'm around people, like, I'll be around someone who's not a churchgoer or not a believer, and I'll say, yeah, I, um, I, my job is to do discipleship groups and talk about Jesus, and they're like, Oh, you, so like you're religious and stuff. And I have to say like, no, like I'm not religious. I just love Jesus. And so um, that kind of like throws them for a loop. And I'm like, they're like, why? And, and I have to explain that like the gospel is freeing. <laughs> the gospel doesn't, doesn't keep me chained to what I should and shouldn't do. But the gospel gives me the opportunity to love people more passionately, um, to be able to recognize um, how God loves them and to share the gospel in the kingdom of God in a new way, um, just as Jesus talked in the new wineskins. And so um, the, the Pharisees were in this cycle of, of do this, don't do this. If you, if you do this, you're bad. I like, And if you don't do this, you're, you're also bad. And so there was a very strict set of laws. I was listening to um, a podcast and someone told me, told, said on that, not me, they're not talking to me. Um, so someone said on that podcast that there are over 600 laws in the Old Testament. I don't even know, like, the Bill of Rights. So, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I think the, what is it, the right to bear arms? Freedom of speech, right to bear arms. I don't know. We're not going to get into that. This is church. Um, uh, I don't even know that. Now, <laughs> now think about keeping up with 600 different laws. How unfreeing does that sound? And that's exactly what Jesus' point is. Um, The laws were meant to be good, yes, to make us holy, to make us closer to God so that God could come and dwell with us. But if it's denying someone from understanding the kingdom and the actions of the kingdom, then Jesus didn't want a part of it. And so this is the first thing that Jesus wants to tell us is, that he valued people over religion. And so the problem with the Pharisees was that they were so focused on doing the right thing that they were missing the right thing to do. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? The problem with the Pharisees is that they were so focused on doing the right thing, fitting inside the box, that they missed the man with the withered hand when the right thing to do was to love him. Because he was a human too. Maybe he was trying to follow the law too, but he just needed some help. Don't deny the person that's right in front of you because you're trying to fit into a box that is a religion. We are followers of Christ, and so follow Christ. He healed the man with the withered hand. He healed the person uh, who was paralyzed. He said, your faith has healed you when they ripped a roof in the ceiling. Um, So Jesus continues to state um, that because he has come to fulfill the law, the rules were made for, those rules were made for religion and were fulfilled by Jesus. He was there. He was fulfilling the law. And so why are we so content to wait for Jesus when he's right in front of us? And why are we so content to not go and stay in our box? I have to ask myself those questions. Number two, the second thing that Jesus is showing us, it was for sinners and not saints are our primary mission. 
Sinners, not saints, are our primary mission. God went about the, the, the town of the place of Galilee, uh, Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, all throughout the land. And he loved sinners. He went up to a tax collector and said, I'm coming to your house tonight and I want to hang out with your sinner friends. And that wasn't cool for everyone else uh, who thought that you weren't supposed to do that. But we are to take after Jesus. It's for sinners and not for saints who are our primary mission. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner that needs saving. I'm a sinner that needs God's grace every single part of the day. I have to pray for that each and every day. And so uh, for me to know that Jesus came for me and that continues to fight for me and be on mission for me every single day makes me want to be on mission for those who don't even know the grace of God yet. The people who are caught in temptation and sin and cycles that are leading them towards hell. When I have the good news inside of me that, yeah, I was going that way too. And if it was up to me, I'd already be there. But God, two words, but God, but God loved me enough to put the kingdom in me, and he can also put the kingdom in other uh, people that may not be believers yet, the worst of the worst, because uh, Paul, in his writings, considers himself the worst of the worst, but yet Jesus still saved him, and now he's, we read his scripture, and it enlightens us to the God that loves us with all of his heart. And so it is for sinners and not for saints that we go and we proclaim the kingdom of God. Because that was Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart um, was the people who didn't know the kingdom but were broken enough to be ready to have it inside of them. And so the kingdom of God is not made for perfected people, but for sinners who have been broken to the point where they are willing to be filled by the most perfected God. I'm going to say that again. The kingdom of God is not made up of perfected people, but of sinners who have been broken to the point where they're willing to be filled by the most perfected God. Who is a sinner in here that has been perfected, uh, has the most perfected God living inside of them? Yeah? Yes. And so with that comes the power and the authority and love that Jesus shows here in these scriptures. Are we aligned with this mission? Jesus went to desolate places to pray over and over and over again to align his heart with the mission that God had sent him for, to love sinners and call out the saints to open their hearts and not be stuck in a box. Are we aligned with this mission? Third, God's rules are about God's love. <laughs> the Sabbath was set aside uh, from the time of Moses, first to be in remembrance of the seventh day when Jesus rested in the first chapter of Genesis. Um, that was what the Sabbath was meant to be set aside for. But also, in that seventh day when God rested, he lorded over the things uh, that he had created. He was the master of them, and he took that opportunity um, to be the master. And so that is a remembrance that we take when we rest on the Sabbath. It's also, secondly, um, a reminder that Jesus will come and make all things new. And we'll be, we'll be celebrating an eternal Sabbath where we're living in his kingdom. And so those are the two things that we celebrate uh, when we take Sabbath. Um, and Jesus knew that we needed rest. And we needed time to be in the presence of God, that he, uh, that he could focus our minds and our hearts on him and give us a break from all the things that were distracting us in our life. And so the Sabbath, uh, the, the people were on Jesus about how he was not doing the right thing on the Sabbath uh, when he says the Sabbath was just about spending time with God, not about a rule that you were supposed to obey to be closer to him. That was the original plan all along, and so I'm just showing you uh, that, this, that this is true. And so um, God's rules are about God's love. Is there a rule that you haven't understood um, in church or in scripture, it just doesn't make sense. All of it comes back to the fact that Jesus loves you enough to want to be close to you. Um, and everything is a reflection of that. Everything that he's done, everything that he's said, um, and that he will continue to do and say is about him wanting to be close to you. The fourth thing 
once I've said this over and over and over again, the kingdom of God doesn't fit into a box, but into people. It doesn't fit in a box, but in people. So the kingdom of God um, doesn't fit in this religious box anymore. And so the, the drying out of the wineskins is a representation of that. There needs to be room to grow, um, room to live, room to be free. And Jesus valued people over religion because the kingdom was always meant to be with them. Jesus valued people over religion because the kingdom was always meant to live inside you and me. Even from the beginning in the garden, the kingdom was meant to live inside of us. And so uh, God is saying, move out of the way because the kingdom is coming to live inside of you. And so here today, we are gathering of the kingdom if you have Christ that is living inside your heart. And we're living into what Jesus is saying in these passages that the kingdom is about people. The kingdom is about people. Luke 17, 21 says this, you won't be able to say here it is or it's over there for the kingdom of God is already among you. It's already among you. 